Welcome to our show, Ask Your Father, a very special edition we have for you to, today. Uh, we, this, this show uh, is a production of Guadalupe Media. We have with us Father James Blunt, Father Jim, si. welcome to our show. Thank you. We're extremely honored to have you. Good to be here. Uh, Father, we, there's so many questions I want to, to ask you. There's so much things I want to hear. Uh, so if we could start, Father, maybe you could tell us, why do you keep coming back to Belize? You know, uh, you, 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 we often see you coming back doing healing masses. Why do you keep coming back to Belize? What does Belize have for you? Well, I love Belize. I love Belize. And I love the people of Belize. And um, I think of... Forgive me for being so blunt, that's, that's, but that's my name. Of course. <laughs> I think that Belize needs a father. I think the world needs a father. I think the world gravitated to John Paul because he was a father to the nations. And I think that Belize needs a father's love. And I love Belize like a father. And so it's like that father-son, father-daughter relationship drawing me like a magnet, you see. Yes. You are my children. I, I would die for Belize. I have to come back because my children are calling me. Mm -hmm. So I come back because I love them. I love you all. Thanks, thanks. We appreciate that, Father. We really do. Thank you. Um, Father, this Guadalupe Media enterprise that we're in today, uh, it started when you were here, under your, when you were pastor at Divine Mercy Parish. Uh, so again, this is a celebration Amen. to have you back on our show. Tell us about the origins. How did this come about for you, the vision? Well, to be honest with you, it began with my brother, Father Tony. Yes. He was a beautiful Tony priest, and he was the pastor in Binke. And there in Binke, he started a small little local radio station at Our Lady Mount Carmel. I think Mr. Mark helped him there as well. Okay. And when I arrived, Bishop Martin asked my community to please send another priest, a salt priest, to Belize. So by some amazing coincidence, I was available. I came to Belize. And he asked me to be there at Mount Carmel and learn from my brother the country and how the church works. When I was there, I encountered the brand new radio station and Bishop Martin had a dream that the radio would graduate to the whole country. So we'd take that little tiny one we had in a classroom at Mount Carmel High School and somehow make it nationwide. So as we were there, the Holy Spirit seemed to anoint my brother, Father Tony, and myself and a few others that the Lord wanted me to take over as the leader of this program, mm -hmm. building the radio station. Mm -hmm. Partly because I'm a bit of an evangelist. Yes. I love to proclaim the gospel. Oh, yeah. And this you is see. a perfect opportunity. And I'm getting perfect cold seed right now. <laughs> I see that. Yes. Father. So they said, uh, Father Jim, you take it over. So we spoke to Bishop Martin. He said yes. And he gave me his dream. So when I came to Divine Mercy Church two months later, praying about it, it seemed to me the Lord wanted us to build it here on the property of Divine Mercy. Mm -hmm. So I took my old parking lot that was for the priests and we tore it down and I spoke to Bishop Martin, gave us his blessing, and we built it from the ground up right here. Mm -hmm. So really, uh, I would give credit to Father Tony for starting it really at a little seed in Binke, in Binke. and then to Bishop Martin for wanting to make it nationwide. Okay. He gave it to me and I ran with it. Okay. With the help of John Marhefka, who was an amazing worker. Definitely, definitely. So it's amazing to see it, to be honest with you. I'm, I'm so blessed to be here, to see the fruit of many years of labor, sweat and suffering. Of course. Tears. And, and the team that is taking it on are wonderful yes. people. Beautiful. Uh, and and uh, Libby Asweta, who is, yes. you know, on top of this game, and it's, it's, it's really going places. I'm so happy, because I wanted to be Belizean. Of course. So I come back, and it's all Belizeans running at it. <laughs> I'm just a little employee now, just know, watching. It's beautiful to see my Belizean people like, like they're growing up and taking over. Mm -hmm. That's what God wants, mm -hmm. that we all be mature in the faith and mature in the ministry. Exactly. So I'm pleased and I'm blessed. Oh, please. Thanks. Thanks, Father. And also, I want you, Father, to tell us about your, your healing ministry. I know that whenever you come to do Mass, you would have the healing component. Yes. And I also know, Father, you, you hear lots of confessions and, uh, f from the faithful. Uh, tell us about the healing and what is going in, on in our country. Well, it was one simple example. Just a few days ago, an older gentleman here in Belize City has been struggling with his ears for several months. Okay. 
and it appears to be part physical and part maybe demonic. And I say that because not only were his ears hurting him for months and the doctors could not help him, he was hearing strange and unusual voices in mm -hmm. both of his ears, mean voices. Mm -hmm. Nothing could help him. And I received the word that this man was desperate and needed a blessing. So I really, my time was all spent. But on our way to go to a healing mass in Binke, I asked my good driver to, would please stop by just for five minutes so I can see the old gentleman. Because, you know, the Bible says to respect the elderly, respect the older ones. So I figured I need to respect him, at least give him five minutes. So we almost made ourselves late for mass. I went into his house and blessed the house real quick. Papa, what's wrong? He described it to me. And I let him touch that relic that you're holding in your hand right now. I let him hold that relic. It's a relic from the Vatican. It's a piece of wood from the cross Jesus died on. I had a blind man see once when I touched it to his eyes. And so I said, listen, brother, touch that to your ears. And he made me laugh because I'll tell you what he did. Let me borrow that for a moment. Usually my good people will touch it. But this old gentleman, I guess he misunderstood me, and he stuck it in his ear. Oh, my goodness. And I had to try not to laugh because I wanted to respect him. He's a good old brother, you know. And he did the same thing on the other ear. He stuck it in his ear. I thought, oh, no, he's making my cross dirty, but that's okay. It's okay, Lord, bless him anyway. And I gave he, the cross back to him, and he blessed himself. I said, Papa, how do you feel now? Father, I feel fine. Well, the pain's gone. The voices are gone. I feel good. Our Lord Jesus healed him like in 60 seconds. And boy, that you keep going. When things like that happen, you can go on and pray for 1,000 more people to see one miracle like that. Yes. And I see a lot of them. The Lord wants to heal his people. And I'll tell you one very interesting quote from our retired Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, who is a saintly pontiff. I've been in his presence before. He's a saintly man. And Pope Benedict, known as a scholar, he's an amazing scholar, but he said this at the end of his papacy, his pontificate. He said, it is now time for the healing gifts of Christ the King to come to the forefront of the Roman Catholic Church. That's what the Pope said. It's time for the healing gifts of Jesus to come to the very front of the Catholic Church. And so we shouldn't suppress the gifts of the Holy Spirit. To me, that's almost a sin and certainly a heresy. We should love the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit and his gifts, the church becomes dry bones, dry. Mm -hmm. We need the Holy Spirit to water the church and to show forth the gifts that we need to make us healthy and powerful and joyful. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit gives us everything we need to be true Christians. And the healing gift in particular, I see that people are dying everywhere that I go, mm -hmm. physically and spiritually. The only one who can heal me is the beautiful one named Jesus. Amen. He sends us the Holy Spirit to heal us. Amen. Amen. Especially through Mother Mary's prayers. Yes, yes. Tell us about Mother Mary and her influence on this father. What role does she play? Well, Mary is defined infallibly as the mediatrix of all graces. Mother Mary is not of a nicety. She's a necessity. Every Christian needs her, including my Baptist brothers and sisters. We need Our Lady. She's the mother of the Redeemer. And when the Father first prophesied the coming of Jesus in Genesis, the very beginning, the first book of the Bible, mm -hmm. when the Lord prophesied the coming of our Redeemer, he also prophesied a mysterious woman. He said, this woman would crush the head of the serpent, and her heel would crush his head. That woman is Mary, the mother of God. And so Mary was included in the divine plan of redemption from the beginning. And by the way, that's why Jesus, when Our Lady approached him at the wedding feast at Cana, when he worked his first public miracle, yes. he addresses his beautiful mother. He doesn't say mama, which is what I call my mom. He said, woman, <laughs> what is this to you and to me? He was recalling the scriptural prophecy that the woman would crush the head of the serpent mm -hmm. through her son, Jesus. Yeah. And so she's included in the whole divine decree of redemption. And I would just make this thought too, that Jesus wants all the women of Belize to be respected and loved. 
And so he didn't want just himself to be uh, adored and glorified, but he wants his mother to be there with him mm -hmm. because he wants it to be both genders, that both the men and the woman are loved and treasured by God. And the Lord, because Adam and Eve got us into this mess, we have a new Adam and a new Eve, probably because God wants women to be loved and respected too. Mm -hmm. It's really a gift for our women as well. It's important you say this, Father, because uh, particularly in our religion, the Catholic, the, the, the men seem to have a dominant role. And uh, we need to recognize our women. Yes. They're the ones, you know, the pillar on, on what we do uh, in our church. Well, if you ever looked at the history of the church and the great saints, it seems that every great male saint, there was a great woman saint right nearby. <laughs> And it may, you see, St. John of the Cross with mm -hmm. Teresa of Avila. Mm -hmm. This happened constantly where a holy male saint, there'd be a holy woman saint right nearby. Mm -hmm. In our own time, John Paul with Mother Teresa. Yes. And they loved each other. She would pray for him and he would encourage her. Mm -hmm. And so that gift of that dynamism between male and female, it's actually something godly and holy. Mm -hmm. It should not be filled with lust in any way, shape, or form that men and women are to cooperate together mm -hmm. to bring the kingdom of God to the earth, mm -hmm. together in marriage and in the church as well. Mm -hmm. So we need holy women desperately. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Father, let's get back to talk about the, the healing. Because I know um, a lot of faithfuls, um, they, they, they long for it. Uh, as a matter of fact, it is what they need for, for their own uh, conversion. They want to see some miracle. <laughs> you know, and I want you to talk to us about miracles in, in our church. But uh, before you do, I have attended uh, some of your healing uh, masses. And, uh, you know, we would start at a certain time and uh, let's say seven o'clock in the evening. And we would be there till past midnight sometimes waiting to, to get uh, the special blessings from you, Father. And we wouldn't be the last ones there. There are lots of people waiting. So people are hungry. Yes. Tell us about that, Father. Miracles and, and these healing service, services, masses. Well, I would say that miracles have become essential. What has happened to the world is we've become materialistic. Yes. And we have teachers telling our children, even in Atlanta where I'm from, in the schools, that there is no God. Wow. And they're teaching our children that's a doctrine of atheism, that's a lie. There is a God, he's beautiful and he loves us, you see? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so people are dying because the one thing we need the most, they're denying our people, mm -hmm. taking it from them. Mm -hmm. But God is the God of religion and the God of science. And we desperately need both, but we need him more. So I see everywhere I go that people are dying on the vine. Mm -hmm. And we need to proclaim the God of wonders. God is a God of power. And sacred scripture mentions in a prophetic way that in the final days, that there will be a form of religion practice without power. That's what I'm seeing in churches all over the world, Catholic or Protestant, like a, a form of religion, religiosity. We go through the motions, but there's no power. God is powerful. That's true. That's true. God is incredible. I was doing a healing service in Georgia a few months ago, and there's a beautiful family there, dad and mom and son and daughter. I went to pray over them, and the Lord said to me, he said to me, breathe on them. Mm -hmm. He spoke to my spirit. So I breathed on the papa and went flying back and hit the ground unconscious. I didn't touch him. The Lord said, breathe on his wife. I went, she went flying back and hit the ground unconscious for half an hour. I went to the children. The Lord said, breathe on her. I breathed on the little girl. She went flying back, hit the ground. And then the little boy, the Lord said, breathe on him. I said, I know what you're up to now. <laughs> and I breathed on him. He went right down. And all four, father, mother, son, and daughter, are laying there for half an hour, being healed by the Holy Spirit. That was a shocking revelation to everyone. So I said, Lord, did I do to all of them? He said, sure. I breathed on everyone. Everyone started falling down. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of people. The Spirit was manifesting Himself. So what's happening is we have a religion without power. We have kind of a dead God. This is a travesty. 
God is awesomely powerful, and he wants to move. If the church will open a little door or a little window, he'll come in, he'll clean house, and he'll fill us with the fire of the Holy Spirit. So we need miracles to testify that that which is unseen is real. How many times have you seen the wind, Vincent? Wow. You've never seen the wind, have you? I don't believe so far. But we see the effects of the wind. Yes. We've never seen God, but we see the effects of God. And we need to see it now. We need it now. We were made, Augustine said it best. St. Augustine said, you made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Amen. They can't rest in anything or anyone else. We have to rest our hearts in God, who is more in love with us than we are in him. He's in love with us. We have to rest our hearts in his fiery love. He is real, and he's waiting to love us if we let him. And if we let him, are we loving God? Are we loving Jesus as we should? No. Father, we will discuss this when we come back to our next segment. You are watching Ask Your Father. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Your Father. Uh, I am your host, Vincent Palacio, and with me we have Father James Blunt, aka better known to us as Father Jim, our own Father Jim. Welcome again, Father. Thank you, Padre. Uh, Father, we left the last segment talking about Belizeans and their, 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 their passion or their, their hunger for God and for Christ. Yes. And you started to answer. Maybe we could go back to that. Do you think as a people we are hungry for, for God, for Christ? Well, we're hungry for God, but I don't think we're hungry enough. Because sometimes we satisfy ourselves with false gods. Some people are seeking money. Mm -hmm. Some people are seeking fame. Some people are seeking food. And we, we tend to satisfy ourselves even with lust instead of God. Mm -hmm. and so we, we get lesser gods. We put them in first place. And when that happens, you no longer hunger for the God of heaven. Because mm -hmm. you're already satisfied in your flesh, you see. And the terrible thing is that satisfaction lasts for a very short while. Only God satisfies, you see. He has the living water. Nothing else will satisfy us. And so that's why all of these sins become addictions. Because they don't work. You've got to keep going back for more and more and more of the faults gone. He'll satisfy you for maybe three seconds, and then you'll be down again. So really, it's a time now, it's a call to believe to forsake all these lesser gods. Mm -hmm. Forsake all of them. We have to look at God himself. Now listen, he sent one Redeemer. There's only one name in heaven and on earth given to man, and given to Belize, by which Belize can be saved. That name is Jesus Amen. Christ. He is the Father's representative. It's the only true, quote-unquote, religion, is the following of Jesus. He's the one the Father ordained to show me the way and to die for my sins. I didn't deserve it. And so Belize, Jesus died for Belize. We have to put all of our trust in the Lord and follow him. Here's the good news, that when you follow him, he supplies everything else. Everything else is given to you. He himself said it. He said, seek ye first the kingship of God and his way of holiness, and all these other things shall be added unto you. Everything else will be added. Bishop Martin asked me to build this station. I oftentimes think the reason he asked me to build it is this, because I have no money. I have no bank account. I have no salary. I was probably the poorest priest in Belize. But he knew that I had faith. I think he gave it to me because he knew I had faith. We built this station. I don't know what it's worth now. They told me several million dollars. How we built it, I don't know. <laughs> Except John and I prayed together every day. We prayed continuously and asked God to build this for us. And we have built this four-floor incredible structure for Belize on faith. God supplied everything, and he's still supplying it now. So listen, my fellow Belizeans, don't worry about anything else. Love Jesus and follow Jesus. If you're stumbling, ask the Holy Spirit to pick you up 
If you're lonely, ask mama to pray for you. But we have to get behind Jesus. That is God's plan for salvation. It's for all of us. Whether we're black or white or young or old, fat or skinny, Jesus is the one. And he has the Father's heart, you see. He knows how to get us to heaven. So I want to encourage everyone to follow the Lord to follow him and indeed in the church he founded in a special way with those seven glorious sacraments. Father, you, you spoke about addictions that we have as a people, particularly our young, our, our young uh, member of our community, uh, our teenagers, and the pressures that they are under. Um, let's talk about that addiction, Father. How can we break some of the peer pressure the addiction that these young people are going through. We, we hear weekly, uh, you know, gun slain in the streets uh, through gang, gang violence. You know, it's, it's horrible out there. Yeah. How can we uh, turn this around as a people? Well, I think, Vincent, that it goes back, honestly, I think it goes back to the parents. And I don't mean to be mean when I no, say that. that's okay, Father. You, it, have to, you have to say it like it is. It goes back to the family and to mom and dad. Mm -hmm. Did a healing mass in Belmopan a few days ago. And there was this beautiful uh, Indian family there. And when I went to pray over the good people, maybe they were falling over in the spirit. But this family, the daddy knelt down in humility. The mother knelt down in humility. While 200 people were standing, they knelt in humility before the Holy Spirit. So therefore, the little boys all knelt down. They, were, they looked at mom and dad, and they knelt in humility and piety and fervor to see those children kneeling like saints. You know why they knelt? Because dad and mom were kneeling. Exactly. And it all comes to that, you see, mm -hmm. that mothers and fathers, you know, to have a child is a privilege. It's an awesome responsibility and a gift. And if I was a married man with children, when I die, the first thing God's going to ask me, if I, had, if I had children, how did you raise your children? I gave them to you as your number one responsibility. You're to get them into heaven. Did you lead them to me? That's the first question that's going to happen when we pass. To have a child is a great gift and an awesome responsibility. We need to pray to Jesus to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to raise them well. And no amount of tablets and laptops and, and computer games and all these things that distract these young minds will, will count on that day, Father. Not at all. And it's, it's so sad, because I see it in the U.S. as well, that it seems to me that many of our parents are buying off their children. They're paying them off. So I buy you a tablet, I buy you a cell phone, just leave me alone. <laughs> Whoa, throw out the tablet, stomp on the cell phone, and give them your love. Amen. Sit with your child, Amen. tell them, I love you, you're the best son in the world. What do you want to do today? Be with your children and lead them to Jesus. And never sleep in on Sunday. Dad, if you sleep in on Sunday, your child will sleep in every day the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So I think it begins with the parents. If you take this seriously, if God sends you a son or daughter, it means he trusts you to bring that son or daughter to heaven. He trusts you on this. Here's, I have a question, a rhetorical question. Sure. Mom and dad, if your child ends up in hell because you didn't raise them correctly, do you really think you're going to heaven? If your son or daughter is in hell, because you let them use drugs and have a fornication, do you think you're going to heaven? We have to think about this. If I want to go to heaven, the best way is make sure my children go to heaven. Amen. 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 I think it begins there with the parents. Yes. Strong message for us parents. And, uh, you know, we get caught up with all the demands on us as, as working parents. And now the wives are working as well. So the kids have, uh, you know, whatever babysitting them, the, 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 the technology. Yes. So we have to get hold of, of that and make sure we raise our children the right way. And you know what, Vinny? Whenever possible, if the parents can survive on one salary or one and a half salaries mm -hmm. and let mom stay home at least part time, 
Better to have less material things and more love for mom and dad. Mm -hmm. I remember as a boy, I'm one of eight children wow. from a big family, and it was hard making ends meet. Sometimes they'd turn off the light in our house because we couldn't pay the bill. And so my mom would and turn off the water as well. Wow. Mom said, run to the bathroom. Quick, fill up the tub with water. We fill up the tub with water before they turn the water off so we can have drinking water for the next few days. I know what it's like to be poor, mm -hmm. but our house was filled with love. Our house was filled with love. And when my mom didn't actually have to work, dad would have her stay home. Mm -hmm. And my best memory growing up is coming home from school and seeing my beautiful mother in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. I would tell her everything that happened that day. Yes. Say, Jimmy, what happened today? I still remember. She was my best friend. Yes. I didn't even realize it at the time. Mama. Every day I gave her my heart, was in my heart, and she loved me and accepted it and gave me advice. I never realized how important that was to one day she had to go to work for a few months. Mm -hmm. And we missed her. It was a hole in the house when she wasn't home. But to have mom home with the children, and the, sm and the, and the smell of the kitchen, uh, that food would be prepared. Yes. And yeah, they do play a very important role for us. Yes. We need mom and we need dad. And by the way, we need both parents. We don't need just mama. We don't need just daddy. God made us from man and woman. Mm -hmm. And every child needs a father and a mother. We need both, desperately. Yeah. Father, let's look at the, the, the fathers, the husbands, because it seems that they, the role that they play, they don't realize their role as the men of their homes. What do you have to say to these fathers? Because they're sleeping at the wheels. The wives are responsible for the spirituality of the children. The wives are responsible for the health of the home, when that should be the role of the father. Tell us about, about these, the role of the father in the house, Father. Well, the scriptures and the teachings of the church are vitally clear. Mm -hmm. The man is not only the head of the household, he's not the dictator, but he's the head, but he's the priest of the family. When the woman takes the role of the head of spirituality, she is contradicting, they are contradicting the word of God. Amen. We're disobeying the Bible. Whether you're Catholic or Protestant or Jewish, you're disrespecting the word of God. And things simply will not work out well if we don't follow God's plan. Mm -hmm. God made men to be leaders not to be dictators, and it's the man who should get up and lead the way, not the woman, the man. That's why God made, he made men taller. He gave them a deeper voice as a symbol of that leadership. And I'll never forget this. One of the greatest men of all time, we saw him here in Belize. His name was St. John Paul the Great. He was a great man of God. But you know his story. He had a father. He had a papa. You will not believe his father. Even when his mother died, as a teenage boy, he would kneel down with his dad at night and pray with his dad, sometimes for one hour together. He and his father knelt on the floor and prayed. Never a day did his father even miss Mass. One day, John Paul, as a teenager, did his prayers with dad, and he went to sleep. And he woke up about three or four in the morning and opened his eyes, and there was his dad, still kneeling by his bed with his hands outstretched, praying for his son. Three or four in the morning, that's the kind of dad he had. And look the man he became. If we have men like that in Belize, we will raise up a generation of saints in this country. If the fathers will show their sons how to love the Lord, we will have men in this country the world has never seen before. Amen. Men like John Paul. Amen. The father is the leader. God has ordained it that way. And the woman is the comforter. You need both. Mm -hmm. You need a leader and you need a comforter. Mm -hmm. Without one or the other, you start to die. That's true. That's true. And where do we learn this? A lot of cycle will have to be broken, Father. Yes. Because the men, their fathers were not like that. So they don't know. Yes. And uh, so the church has a role to play as well, to educate these husbands, these fathers, as to their role as fathers. Yes, Vince. Because it's just too common. Yes. yes. What you're describing is an ancestral bondage. Exactly. 
There's an ancestral bondage over this country. It's in other countries as well. Um, sort of a weak manhood type of bondage. Yeah. And it's something that's atrocious. It needs to stop now. It needs to stop. But I think, Vince, that you and this station are part of the solution. I know that you're trying to have shows that are geared towards building men to be men of God. Mm -hmm. That's part of the solution is here. Mm -hmm. Part of the solution are the priests. The priests have to be men of God. We can't be weak and wimpy priests. Mm -hmm. The world is dying. The world is dying. The priests should become saints. St. Thomas Aquinas said that all the vocations are incredibly important. They all require holiness, but Thomas Aquinas, considered the greatest intellect who ever lived, said that the priest must have the highest level of holiness. And so really, the priest of Belize, the priest of the country of the world, we have to get on our knees and pray and become men of the Holy Spirit and help to lead the men in the ways of the prophets. The priests have a role to play as well. We have to be strong and holy men. Not necessarily severe. We should be happy men. Of course. But of strong. Course, of course. And Father, you talk about prayer. You know, the father praying with his family. That, that, that hits home to me because I take that very seriously. And one of the prayer, or what we do in my household, is pray the rosary. Yes. We try to do it daily. Um, sometimes we do not meet that obligation, but it's something that we, we, we try to do. Good. Uh, Father, and I know... Uh, quite a few of my friends and colleagues uh, pray the rosary as well. Yes. And they speak of the, the miracles that have uh, uh, resulted from praying the rosary. Yes. Let's talk about praying the rosary, Father. I see you hold it in your hand. Yes. I wear it around my neck. I don't go without it. See. Tell us about why I do this, Father. <laughs> well, the rosary has been described as a ladder to heaven. And it has, it's kind of like a, like a ladder that maybe a helicopter would send down to lift you up. <laughs> it's a ladder that brings us up towards heaven. And it's a prayer for all Christians. The rosary is for Catholics, for Baptists, and for Mennonites. The rosary is for Lutherans and Episcopalians. The rosary is for Pentecostals. It's for everyone. Mm -hmm. And what it is, is a meditation on the life of Jesus, is what it is. That's the heart of the rosary. And John Paul who said this was his favorite prayer, was the rosary, this incredible, intelligent, holy, manly man of God, mm -hmm. said this was his favorite prayer. Saint Padre Pio with the stigmata said this prayer, the rosary, is the weapon for our time. It is a weapon against Lucifer. Don't forget that the Lord promised to Our Lady that through her and her son, the devil would be crushed. So this is Mary's weapon she gives to us. But in some, it's a meditation on the life of Jesus. His birth, his ministry as a priest, his suffering on the cross, and his resurrection. And so when you pray the rosary, you're entering into the biblical life of Jesus, but through the eyes of the one who loved him most, Mama, Mother Mary. So the rosary, because it's an immersion into the life of Jesus with his mother, it's filled with power. When you pray all four rosaries a day, you've literally prayed the New Testament. Mm -hmm. You've prayed all four Gospels every day, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The rosary is the Bible prayer. This is the Gospel prayer. And it's an immersion into the heart of Jesus and the heart of Mary, his mother. And it brings all manner of graces. The Bible says, He, Jesus, has won for believes every spiritual blessing in the heaven. He's won for us every blessing in the heavens. And those can be accessed through the rosary in a particular way. It's almost like inviting heaven down into your living room every day. When you pray, the Spirit comes. And I would like to, to encourage people who find it boring, people who find it long. It, it, it's not very long, Father. You start a decade and before you finish... The, the first decade, you wonder where the second, second, third, fourth, fifth went because it goes so quickly. See. So it, it, once you start doing it, it becomes easier and it becomes, you get dependent on it. Yes. So it's, it's, it's an easy prayer. See. You know, I, I used to, I remember that I wasn't into praying the rosary myself. And you invited my wife and I, you probably will not recall, to do adoration at Divine Mercy way back. And we were to lead the rosary over an hour. So we had to go up to the podium 
And you don't realize, Father, you didn't realize then the amount of preparation that went into that, you know. How do you do this? What do you say? When do you say? So, uh, again, my passion for the rosary, you probably play some role with that, Father, of which I'm very grateful. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Well, Vincent, I would add this. If anyone's having trouble with the rosary, this is what I did as a, as a teenager, is get images of the, the 20 mysteries. Yes. Get a biblical painting of, let's say, the Annunciation. So have pictures of the mysteries. Now, the center of the rosary is not the repetition of the Hail Marys. The heart of the rosary is my meditation on the life of Christ. I am to visualize the mystery. I see you, Jesus, rising from the tomb in front of me, and you're smiling at me. I am to visualize the mystery, make it come alive and enter into the mystery. That's meditation, you see? Behel Mary is the background. It's like the drum. I used to be a musician, and the drummer would keep the rhythm. The Hail Mary keeps the rhythm. But the meditation on the life of Christ is actually the heart of the rosary. It's interesting. And every day is different. Well, every day is different indeed. Yes. Father, we will go to break. Okay. We, we, we're, we're covering some very good grounds. Thank you. Um, thank you again. You are watching Ask Your Father. We will be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Ask Your Father. I am Vincent Palacio. Uh, with me, we have Father Jim, our own Father Jim. Thank Welcome, you. Father. Uh, Father, as we get into this last segment of our, our show, uh, you were talking about, again, the role of the Father in our homes and uh, a study that was done in the U.S. prison system. Yes. Tell us about that, Father. It was an absolutely remarkable study. What was done, it was repeated in several prisons across the entire country, then replicated in other countries as well. But they had an interview, a survey of the male prisoners. Mm -hmm. most, most of them are male of in, the, in the prisons. And they asked them among the questions, the male prisoners, do you love your mother? And predictably, about 95% of them said, we love our mothers. And there's another question a little further down. Do you love your father? More than 90% of the prisoners said, no, I hate my father. It was a stunning survey, duplicated scientifically across the United States and then several other countries as well. I would dare to say it might be true in Hattieville as well. That's a powerful I, I, I wouldn't thing. doubt. And it shows that that relationship with dad, if it's broken, if it's not there, if my daddy hates me, or I think he hates me, or if he, I just never see my dad, then there's something vital missing, you see? Mm -hmm. and so we went through a terrible revolution, I think, in, in our countries. Um, not only the sexual revolution, which was a disgrace, but even the woman's liberation. We, are, we must love our women and treasure them. Definitely. But one of the aspects of the radical women's movement was that fathers are not necessary. You don't need men. Nothing could be further from the truth. We desperately need our fathers too. And especially the young men, but for girls as well. And in fact, we know this from psychology now. This has already been proven, not by Catholic, by secular psychologists, mm -hmm. is this. That the identity of the boy and the girl come from the father. The child, actually, when a child is small, we actually know this scientifically, a little baby actually thinks he or she is part of his mother. The child actually sees himself as an extension of his mother, not as a separate person. It's precisely the deeper voice of the father. Now, we know this through psychology, through regular psychology. It is the father who calls the child out of the mother to be a person independent of his or herself. Be a person independent with your own dignity, with your own vocation, your own vision. It is the voice of the Father and his love that give teenagers their identity. Now, what are we suffering with now with the teenagers in Belize and the U.S.? They don't know who they are. And some of the terrible situations that are occurring are almost unspeakable. Like my brother in Texas, myself in Georgia, all in the last month, have teenage girls coming to us telling us they think they're boys. Yes. I hear a voice inside of me, I think I'm a boy. Where is this nonsense coming from? 
mostly because the fathers are gone. We must have our fathers. Our mothers, you might say, uh, our body is formed within our mother's womb. And she strokes us and loves us. She helps us, you might say, on the emotional level. But my father has to be on that intellectual, spiritual level. We have all these levels working. The physical, the emotional, the intellectual, and the spiritual. The father is much more pronounced on those last two. So we, the first two important women were one and five and ten. But daddy is irreplaceable. You get to be 10 and 12 and 15 and 20. We need to be affirmed, you might say, intellectually and spiritually as well. Definitely. Definitely. And uh, Father, there's, and we're so missing. I used to do a retreat for uh, primary school leaving young men going into high school uh, called Boys to Men, a program. And uh, on a south side primary school, over 75% of the boys were from a single parent, a yes. mother, yes. no father. Yes. So, and we're talking about uh, 96 to 100 boys. Yes. So you could, you could see the challenge that these poor young men are going through. Yes. And uh, then moving on to high school. And I, uh, I'm also involved with another parish on the south side, Belize City, where around confirmation time, the school would have to call around the parish to, to identify uh, men to be godfathers for the boys because they don't have fathers at home yes. and nobody in their area they could see as reputable people to be godfather. So there, there's a, a void, there's a gap. We have to pray for these families, Father. Vincent, I always think of this. Tell me what you think of this. Sure. But in my priestly ministry, I do a lot of counseling and I notice that the role of affirmation is essential, mm -hmm. that we have to be affirmed if your listeners want a very good book to study, Dr. Conrad Bars, Dr. Conrad Bars has written authoritatively in this area about the need for affirmation, which the word affirm means to give firmness, to give strength. It comes from your papa. And I was thinking about this one day because I had some counseling appointments coming up. And the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, without whom we cannot live as Catholics, the Spirit led me as I was praying to the gospel. And he showed me Jesus our Lord baptized. And then the Lord, the Spirit showed me what occurred at that moment when our Lord Jesus Christ, true God and true man, was baptized in the Jordan River by John the Baptist. He arose from the waters. The Holy Spirit appeared physically over his head. But then the Bible says, the voice of the Father was heard. The fathers, it was not complete without the father. You can't leave the father out, even if you're a God-man named Jesus. And the father's voice was heard. And what did he say? He said to Jesus, he said to the crowd, This is my beloved son. Listen to my son. And that's when the Lord riveted me, the Holy Trinity that day, that even Jesus needed affirmation from his father before he went out on his manly adult ministry. He was beginning his public ministry. If Jesus needs a father who affirms him publicly, how about the boys of Belize? Do you see what I mean? Yes. And so this idea of affirmation and fatherhood, to use the same phrase we used earlier, is not a nicety, it's a necessity. It's absolutely necessary. I would only add one more thought without going into detail right now. I think Lucifer, I believe Satan, not only hates God, he hates God the Father. He considers the Father a rival. He hates our Father. And therefore, events, I'm ashamed to say it, Lucifer hates you because you're a father. You remind him of the heavenly father. So do I as a priest. Lucifer, the devil, hates fatherhood because we remind him of God and he wants to destroy God. He wants our children for himself. So he's wiping out the image of the father all over the land because the devil hates fatherhood. And so I say, we need a massive deliverance of the whole country and the whole world. Fatherhood is good, it's not bad. Fathers are not meant to be drunks or druggies either. Fathers should never have a mistress on the side. We're not to live in lust. We are to love our God as men. We'd be willing to die for our wives and our children. 
That's the measure of love. And a priest should be willing to die for his parish. I don't say that in a funny way. I actually mean it. The priest should be willing to die for his people. You see? That's the measure of manhood. A father is called to sacrifice in love for his children. That's missing, and the world is dying. And I think it's Lucifer's master plan. Our Lord, though, is going to reverse it. A victory is coming soon. A victory, a worldwide victory is coming soon. Tell us about that victory, Father. We, we need to hear it because, you know, sometimes you feel, we feel, or I feel, that uh, we're, we're not winning, we're not making uh, uh, much progress. But I hear you when you say, victory is coming. Yes. Tell us about that victory. Well, the Lord has not abandoned man. Man has abandoned the Lord. He hasn't abandoned us. We've abandoned God. But God has a plan. You see, he loves the prodigal son. And you remember, in the parable, he let the prodigal son go out to the pigsty and work with the pigs. He let him do it. He let him follow his will because he knew he would reawaken his conscience at some point and bring him back. That's what has to happen with Belize and the U.S. and the world. The Lord has let us go to the pigsty. And the pigsty we're eating from is on our iPads and our phones. We're eating from a pigsty, what we're eating from. I'm speaking of pornography in particular and many other wasteful or foolish things that we're doing. But the Lord will wake up our consciences that they're about to awaken now. God always has a plan. The bottom line is man cannot save himself. We can't. He has to let us come to that realization. Because without that realization, we men, especially men, we think we're God. We act like we're little gods, but we're not God. We have to sort of come to the end of our resources so there's nowhere left to look but up. But Teresa of Avila said it best. She said, when you come to the place where you have nothing left in your life but God, that's when you discover God is all you ever needed, you see? When you come to the point where there's nothing left but God, that's when you finally learn God was all you ever needed. God is beautiful. He's our father and our friend and our brother and our food and our joy and our love and our life. God is our everything. Amen. He made Belize. Amen. He made Belizeans. He has a plan for this country. Everything is found in God and God is found in Christ. And Christ is found in prayer. The Virgin has been given to us, the Virgin Mary, to lead us to these truths. Not to herself. Mary always points to Jesus. When we say Mary, she says Jesus. She leads us to the Lord. And I would like to share two apparitions that have occurred, one more than 400 years ago. And I would invite everyone to look up, if you can, Our Lady of Good Success in Ecuador. The Virgin Maria appeared to Sister Mariana Torres more than 400 years ago in Ecuador. And she prophesied many, many events that would occur that have all occurred accurately in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, Mary prophesied through Mariana Torres. And she told Sister Mariana more than 400 years ago that by the year 1950, now she mentioned this by name 400 years ago, by the year 1950, darkness would begin to cover the earth. And then, would you believe this, the Virgin Mother, in words that have been testified to even by the Bishop of Ecuador, said, that by the year 2000, the darkness would be so heavy, you could even find, you could not even find an innocent child. Mother Mary prophesied this. She said the darkness would be so thick that even the church would begin to collapse. And Our Lady said, after the year 2000, and we should start by getting cold seed right now because this is the time she prophesied. Mother Mary, more than 400 years ago, in prophecies completely approved with an imprimatur by the bishop. They've been tested and approved. Mother Mary said that after the year 2000, when it appears, just when it appears, that everything is lost, I will come down from heaven with my son Jesus. I will chain the devil, I will cast him into hell, and I will convert the human race to the Christian faith. Indeed, the Catholic faith. Now, here's what's interesting. Mother Mariana is incorrupt. Her body 
four hundred years dead is more supple than mine. This is impossible. But here's what's even more amazing, because there are several incorrupt saints across the world, several, by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a sign, by the way, of the resurrection. But the Virgin Mary appeared not only to Mother Mariana, but to six other nuns in the convent with her. Amazing apparitions. The angels would appear physically to them. All seven nuns are incorrupt. They're laying in one coffin side by side. Their bodies are fresher than ours. Seven nuns in one convent more than 400 years ago dead have bodies as fresh as ours. One of the greatest miracles in the history of the human race. And that was God giving his seal to this prophecy. And so we have a prophetic word, there are many of them, by the way, that our Lord and Our Lady are coming soon. As soon as we get tired of eating from the pigsty, we look up, God has a plan. I would say, Belize, Belize, lift up your heads today and look up at the sky because he's coming soon. Look up, your Redeemer is coming. He has a plan to save us. And I would mention one more if I could. Sure, please do, Father. This one's recent. This is in our lifetime. But our Lord has appeared to Elizabeth Kindleman, our Lord and Our Lady, to a, a beautiful old lady in Hungary. And what, a, what an example of a life she has, because this was a widow who raised six children without her husband. He died young. She was so poor, she was actually thrown out of her house and was living on the street with six kids. She had a very difficult life. She's a good one for all of us to look to. But our Lord and Our Lady appeared to Miss Elizabeth Kindleman recently. She just went to her reward just a few years ago. And our Lord told Elizabeth that he's going to give her, give her some prayers for the world to pray. And when we say these prayers, it would bring the Holy Spirit down over the world. And the great victory that was prophesied even at Fatima will come as a result of these prayers and Our Lady's intercession. And so the Lord has given us new prayers, again approved by the church, that are meant to bring an incredible victory, the conversion of the entire world, to Jesus and his church soon. So maybe we should pray to leave, Father. Yes, Vince. Vince, let's do it like I do at the healing mass. Sure. I'm going to say the, a line and you repeat it. Definitely. That way we get it when we hear it twice, okay? Sure, Father. We call the unity prayer, and this is for everyone in Belize, Catholics, Protestants, everyone. This prayer is for all of us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. This prayer protects us and begins to bring the victory. First we say this. My adorable Jesus. My adorable Jesus. May our feet journey together. May our feet journey together. May our hands gather in unity. May our hands gather in unity. May our hearts beat in unison. May our hearts beat in unison. May our souls be in harmony. May our souls be in harmony. May our thoughts be as one. May our thoughts be as one. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our ears listen to the silence together. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our glances profoundly penetrate each other. May our lips pray together. May our lips pray together. To gain mercy from the Eternal Father to gain mercy from the Eternal Father. Amen. Amen. That's the unity prayer. That's the unity prayer. It's a beautiful prayer, eh? Very profound, Father. And it brings a profound protection over you and your family. Mm -hmm. Let's every one of us say it every morning for protection. And I would say, say it a second time, everyone in Belize, for the country. Because it blinds the evil spirit from seeing you. That is the promise of the Lord when we say this prayer. There's another smaller prayer, and they'll see it when they pick up the card. But the little one goes like this. You add it to the Hail Mary, but I just want to say the phrase. Mother Mary, spread the effect of grace of thy flame of love over all of humanity. That's the second prayer. And our Lord said Mary would send a flame of love, which is nothing less than Jesus himself, to live in every human heart. The greatest conversion in the history of the church and the history of the world is about to come to the world. Oh, thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. And we have to be ready. Yes. We have to be ready. Yes. Our souls must be ready to, to receive, See. Uh, receive the, 
that when Jesus come come again. And you said it, it's coming. Yes. It's not too far off. No. And a great conversion before he comes in glory, a conversion is coming to the world. I would I would would it recommend to everyone, even the Baptist brothers and sisters, everyone to pray your rosary. It's for all Christians to keep ourselves safe in the times that may be coming in the near future. Our Lady has promised those who pray the rosary will be protected, whatever background you have. Mm -hmm. So everyone pray the rosary for protection over the days and months to come. Father, we've, we've said a lot. We've covered a lot of grounds. I'd like to give you the last word, uh, any last suggestions, any last recommendations for us as a people here in Belize. Um, you know, you, you've, you've said it through, throughout your, your presentations this, uh, this time, but just if there is anything else that you think you missed. You know, Vinny, I would say, yes. Um, first of all, I would say that in a way that you're a good example of what we want for Belize. We want men and women to be joyful Christians that there's too many sad-faced Christians in Belize and too many stern-faced Christians. And that goes for us priests and nuns as well. If we're reading the same Bible, Belize, I don't know if we read the same Bible, but here's what my Bible says. It says, I have come that you might have joy and have it to the full. Have it abundantly. See, that's my Jesus. And so I would say that we need to begin praying for joy. One of the saints said this. A saint actually said this. God, spare the church of one more grouchy face saint. God, spare the church. We need to start smiling and reflecting the joy of the Lord. St. Thomas Aquinas said that in the heart of the Holy Trinity, in the deep recesses of heaven, is a burning inferno of joy. God is joyful, and Jesus came to earth to bring us joy. And the Bible says in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord shall be your strength. So I would say, Belize, become strong, become happy, not in sin, not in sex, not in money. Get happy in the Lord. Amen. That will make you strong. It will bring you to heaven. And one last thought is the Eucharist. We can't forget the body of Christ. This is for all Christians as well. The Eucharist is for all Christians. If you get on your YouTube and look up on your YouTube, everyone watching Eucharistic Miracles, I say, put on your seatbelt and get ready. They have been scientifically validated, the host bleeding in the hands of priests around the world. Unbelievable what's happening. There's a, there's a, now in Argentina, a Eucharistic miracle. It's a piece of cardiac tissue. The host turned into heart flesh and it's pumping even now on its own. These have been scientifically validated. The greatest gift of God to the church has been the Eucharist. And the Eucharist is pan de gozo, is the bread of joy. So we invite all of the Christians of Belize and everyone, even if you're an atheist, come to the table. Come to the table. The food is free. He paid for it on the cross for Belize. With every drop of blood, he paid the price. Come to the table. The meal is free. It will give you joy and prepare you for heaven. All you need, Jesus has it in his heart. It's in his heart, it's in the sacrament, it's in the church, the Eucharist. Of course, of course, the Eucharist. How could we forget that one? I'm glad you remembered to, to put a plug in there for that, Father. I saw your poster, that's how I remember it. Yeah, that's how you remember it. It's, it's, it's all around. Um, Father, we'd like to thank you for coming. We'd like to thank you for being a part of, of this very special show. My privilege. Uh, you're always welcome. <laughs> Whenever you. you come back home to Belize, Father, yeah, there's, a, there's a spot for you on this couch. Thank you, To Vince. come and talk to us thank about you. what you're doing. Appreciate We're it. We're extremely happy to have to I'm have glad you. to. My joy. And thank you for the work you're doing in, in our country. You've been watching Ask Your Father. I am your host. And before we go, of course, we'll ask Father... Uh, Father Jim, to bless us, bless our viewers, sure. bless the country okay. uh, before we, we wrap up. Father. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Father, you love my Belizean people. You love them with an infinite love. And if necessary, you would come down from heaven yourself and die on a cross yes. that every Belizean could be saved. Lord, I speak your word of salvation over Belize. 
I rebuke all that is demonic and evil in this country. And I proclaim now in the names of Jesus and Mary, victory over Belize, that every Belizean, man, woman, and child, will love Jesus Christ, will follow Jesus, will love the Father, will be eternally saved, and that Belize will become a paradise of grace, a paradise of holiness. This is my blessing for Belize, that Belize would awaken from her slumber. Yes, Lord. She would arise from the dead yes, and become Lord. a holy nation, pleasing to God, bringing joy to others and a light to all the nations. May the blessing of God be upon every Belizean in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and Amen. unending joy besides. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Father. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been watching Ask Your Father. With, I'm your host, Vincent Palacio, along with Father Jim, Jim Blunt. Uh, we're, we'd like to thank you for being with us, and we'll see you next time.